Hey again, welcome to Module 14. Now, Module 14, they have a perception of it being troubleshooting Windows after startup. I like to call this module the be aware of how dangerous you can be when it comes to things you don't know in an operating system. So a lot of things that we'll deal with in this module that can do significant damage. So this is one of those areas where we've got to make sure we have a thorough understanding before we go in and make changes. So this is kind of a, you don't know what you don't know until somebody lets you know what you don't know. Um, when it comes to operating systems, software, any applications, and it could be hardware as well. We've got to be very cautious um, because significant damage can be done. Um, I had a conversation with a student yesterday, and he has a fear of working on computers or doing things with computers because he doesn't want to damage the system whether it's a physical damage, software damage, whatever it may be. And he's apprehensive to perform tasks for fear that a minor mistake can have a significant outcome. Well, this module, module 14, is where that becomes a fact. Uh, little things can have a significant impact or the system won't run without some deep, deep uh, repair taking place. So let's jump in. All right. um, at this point, the system has, in theory, started up. So that's our, our assumption at this point. It's up and running. And things may not be running the way we want them to run. So that's the assumption we have right now. System is up and running. Could be Windows 10, could be Windows 11, whatever it may be. And things are not as they should be, or as we expect them to be. So that's how we're going to move forward. But from another perspective, we need to look at how does this whole system work? What are the different layers? And if there is an issue, where, where does that issue live? How, how do I get to it to find out how to resolve it? So we've got a graphic here, this figure one in module 14, or 14-1. Now, we have the operating system as a whole. So this folder, as they look at it, this is the operating system. Now, I commonly call the operating system the office manager. And it manages all the employees, all the devices. It tries to control everything that's going on in the office. That's kind of what the operating system does. But it does it in different ways. And when we look at it, we've got the shell. And below that layer, we've got a layer called the kernel. The kernel is what allows the operating system to interact with hardware. Now, some can go directly to the hardware. Others may have to go through what's called the hardware abstraction layer, or how to be able to interact with specific pieces of hardware. We'll deal with this more moving forward, but this is the, the hierarchy or the layers, if you will, of what's taking place. Now, there's you, me, whoever up here, and we interact with some kind of interface, a GUI, an application, um, applets. It could be a variety of different ways that we interact with the shell. Applications can interact with the shell. 
We've also got something else that this is the the place that you don't go play in unless you know what you're doing. It's called the registry and configuration files. Now, the best way to describe what the registry and configuration files are, we've talked previously in part relative to configuration files. So we've got documentation or instructions, if you will, guidelines, data about how things are supposed to be done, stored in a variety of different ways and places in the computer. We've got boot files that describe how the system will go about starting up. We've got files that describe the users, who's been there, where we've visited, different things like that. We've got a registry that has information in it about users, about applications, all kinds of little details that may include things like when it was installed, what the key is for the licensing, specific configurations relative to that application or that individual. There's a variety of different things and should go touch on it a little bit later in this module. So let's go talk about the shell first. The shell is pretty much what we interact with. That's that layer. We've got the kernel, we've talked about that. That's in between the shell and the hardware. Now, pop on over to the next one. We also have what are called directory structures. Now, I say directory structures. We have files and folders as a way to store things, data, information, whatever you want to call it, in this system. And there's a hierarchy of files and folders and subfolders and subfolders and other files. And we name these things so they have meaning, whatever is in them. And it's not just us that has files and folders in here. The operating system has a structure all its own. And then we go create what we want to have stored for us in our special little area. But most of what's going on in this directory structure is all created by the operating system. In there, We've got program files, we've got folders for Windows and the data associated with it, where the registry is, a backup of the registry, different fonts, temporary files, tons of stuff that is stored in system files. Some of these things I've talked about in previous lectures, they're hidden. We don't want anybody to get to them. Um, Windows deals with these files and folders, and we also have an understanding that different applications are doing the same kind of thing. So, we'll pop back here and I'm going to do a quick reminder. Now, remember I said we interact with a shell that interacts with a kernel that interacts with hardware. Applications also interact with a shell, kernel, hardware, and layers. So the applications don't talk to the kernel directly. There's a go-between. So with that said, applications like Microsoft Word. So we've got Word here. It's an application. So when I run Word.exe or WinWord.exe, that will 
start the application. Now that application is running. CPU is processing commands relative to that application. That application is also using RAM. So we've got processing that we're using capacity there, and we also have RAM that we're using to store whatever data we may need to be working on. So that application now has access to via, not the kernel, remember what, how they, how they had the access to get through? Go back and look one more time. The kernel, but the shell, the application's talking to the shell to be able to do things. So here's our shell right here, 132. So the application says, I want to print a job. Print. You click print. It then talks to the shell, 132, talks to the kernel, printer. Application, open a file, connects to 132, connects to the kernel, connects to the hard drive. So each one of these is a thread. Now, we've got us interacting with the shell, applications interacting with the shell. Um, things happen. Connections get damaged, broken. It could be a variety of different things. Sometimes resources that are being used by one process for whatever reason it should not happen but inevitably it does resources become shared between different applications and as long as those two applications can play nice with each other and not fight over that resource or not do something with that resource that prevents the other application from effectively using it, we don't have any problems. But all too often, it's like kids sharing. Best analogy that I can use. The two kids sharing a toy. One kid doesn't want to let the other one use it. Problem. One kid doesn't treat it the way it should and breaks the toy. Says, I don't care about it. I'm done with it anyway. And now the other kid can't play with the toy because it's broken. These are the kind of things that happen within the computer. But it's resources that are being fought over. And resources that are being damaged. So the different tools that we can use, we can go into control panel and go see what's installed. Open up different, different applets relative to the control panel. We go into administrative tools or Windows tools, more applets there. Computer management, more applets to go through and deal with administrative tools that manage users, groups, permissions, all that kind of stuff. We've got the MMC. I can go down to the start menu, type MMC or MMC.exe, and we'll get that Microsoft Management Console up and running. And that will allow us more tools. So a variety of different tools that we can use to go see what's going on. Event viewer, task manager, and control alt delete, run task manager. I'm going to see what's going on. A variety of different things to you know, the way the authors said it. Look under the hood to see what's going on not acting the way that it's supposed to be acting. Hey, do I hear a noise under the hood? And we're not necessarily going to hear a noise, but there very well could be some indicator of what's going on in one of these applets. So there's a lot of tools that are built in so we can see what's going on. So we'll go through, look at some of the tools. And if we go in to control panel and look at administrative tools, the list of different tools. Okay. We'll pop open 
computer management. And in computer management, we've got a sub list of tools in there. Now, it could be system tools, event viewer, different folders, uh, device manager, storage. There's a variety of different things that we can do in there. MMC, very commonly used. We can go dig in there and go see a variety of different things. And we add in whatever it is that we want to add in. So we build it towards personalized in a way. Um, event Viewer is one of those things that we can keep logs of what's taking place. Go look and see, hey, what's, what's going on? Are errors being thrown? Did things work the way they're supposed to be working? Is the system saying, hey, warning? And it keeps thinking about that, that movie Danger Will Robinson and the robot saying, hey, we got a problem over here. Same kind of thing, an event viewer. It can throw warnings to where, hey, you need to address this. You need to keep an eye on this. Doesn't take long to go take a look under the hood, if you will, to go see what's going on. So we've got a variety of different logs. Administrative events logs, application logs, security logs, setup logs, system logs. Each of these things are archiving logs of what's taking place. We don't see it unless we go look for it, but they exist. And keep in mind, it could have events that, are, hey, we got a critical issue, it's got an error, we got warnings, whatever it may be. That's all intended for the administrator. Now, we've got, much like task manager, we've got resource manager or resource monitor. and allows us to dig in and look at different processes and how they're beating up the system. Um, it's a great resource to see it's almost a good analogy for this is tracking your bank account and where you spend money. I'm a firm believer if you don't measure something, you can't expect to have any control over it. So it'd be like you having a, a debit card and not keeping track of how much money you got in your account. Maybe just steady go use your debit card whenever and don't ever look to see what's in it. That means you're not measuring what you have in there. You're just assuming it's good. I got plenty of money in there. <clears throat> Some point you don't. This resource manager allows us to measure things that are taking place. Now that we're measuring them and we can see what's going on, we can have some control over what's taking place. Maybe there's a denial of service attack that's taking place because of some malware somebody's installed on the computer. I can go in here and look and see what's going on and see where the process is. What's the application that's actually doing it? Right, let's jump ahead a little bit. So, this is the resource monitor. Now we've got performance monitor. And that looks at the resources over time, very similar to what we were just looking at. Looks at the amount of processor time that's being utilized. Now, there's two things we really have to worry about when it comes to the computer and this thing being efficient and doing what we want the way we want. I talk about them over and over again. One is the processor, the other is the memory. The processors are CPU or GPU. The memory is our RAM and it's also our hard drive. But first and foremost, our RAM. Okay. How things are moving in and out of these resources dictate how efficient and effective the system is. So if we're having problems processing, maybe disk write time, 
That's saving info to the, or saving data to the hard drive. We got a lot of idle time. Let's just sit. How long does it take to read? So all these different things that I can go monitor, keep track of. So we can look at the performance of the disk drive itself, the hard drive, the performance of RAM, the CPU, all these things to see what's taking place. That's our measuring. Now that we've measured it and we get an understanding of what's taking place, now we can start to try and control things, fix things, find out what's going on. So a task manager, so I mentioned this a little while ago, this is my go-to. As soon as something starts acting funny, I hit control alt delete I go in and I click task manager, and here we go. This is the interface we get. We've got the processes, the performance, application history, startup, what things start when the computer is turned on, different users, details, and services. A vast amount of data going on in here. We can prioritize based on the resources being utilized. So I said CPU, RAM, and hard drive. So that's the first three right here. They also have network, and then they've tacked on GPU as an alternate here. And these, this last one is GPU engine. Are we piggybacking off of the GPU to supplement the CPU. And we'll see that over here sometimes. We go and look at details of whatever the process is over in that column on the left. We can sort them alphabetically. We can sort them by uh, how much CPU they're using. So the ones that are using the most CPU at the top or flip around the other way, the ones using the least CPU, we can find out. It's broken down into two sections, the applications and the background processes. Think about that. This is where we're dealing with applications that are running on the OS. This is relative to the OS, things you don't see. It's all under the hood, behind the scenes. So we can jump over and look at say, different details and it'll list the name of the application. Process ID, is it running? Has it paused? We can go through, restart it. Who's initiating it? Who's, who's the one causing that application to run? You can see that here. How much CPU time, how much memory, and a description of it. Sometimes these names don't mean anything to us until we look over here and say, oh, that's something to do with Microsoft Outlook. So that whole thing we access, just Control, Alt, and Delete. Hold down all three keys, same time, let off, and then that will get us to the little uh, applet that'll give us interaction to get to task manager. Now, depending on which tab we're on, here's performance. I can look at CPU performance and it's real time performance. And we watch it move across the screen as things are happening. And we can click on any individual measure and see over time what's taking place. Now, if your CPU's maxed out, something's beating that system up. If your disk is maxed out, memory is maxed out, then we got to go dig and see what app is doing it, what process is using that resource. So this is that whole thing, like I said, if you can measure it, you can control it. Here's our method or mechanism to go through and measure things, dig down deep to find out what exactly is taking place. Then we start controlling things. Now, once we know what's going on, we find the resource that, I shouldn't say the resource, we find the application or the process that is utilizing or abusing the resources. 
Now we're going to find out what is that process. Why is it running? Who started it? Is it malware? Is it part of something else? One of the things that you'll see, if you use Google Chrome as a browser, one of the things you will see is Chrome is very resource intensive, meaning it uses a lot of memory, it can use a lot of CPU, get a lot of processes going. So right here it says Gene Andrew, Andrews 73. There are 73 different processes running under Gene Andrews for that user. If we came over to processes, we could see Google Chrome 14, 32. So 32 different processes branded as Google Chrome or instances of Google Chrome running. I said, wait a minute, 32? I've only got one window up with Chrome. Yeah, but you've got 17 different tabs open or 40 tabs open and it's so it each one of those tabs is another process the things we've got to take into consideration when things start how they start we've got to be able to deal with that and get an understanding what triggered it to run and when and know why okay so we can go into the services console. Now, I get to it. Uh, using services M MSC, I just go into the search and it'll pop it up for me. Task manager may not have everything that I need. May not let me access certain things. May not let me stop certain things. But if I get into these other applets, they may allow me more power, if you will, to be able to do things. And they may provide me more information. And we can go in and look at properties, things that may not exist in Task Manager. Remember I said Task Manager, that's my first go-to. But it's not my only go-to. Depending on what's going on, I'll have other more powerful, more detailed resources I can access to get the job done. How was it started? Did it automatically start? Started after some delay at a certain point in time? Did somebody manually start it? Uh, is it disabled? It couldn't be started? There's a variety of different things relative to these different tasks that are being run. Um, I can schedule things to happen at a certain point in time, but not just me. Software can interact with the system, interact with task scheduler, and make things happen at a certain point in time. So there could be some malware that has set up scheduled tasks to run. So now I'm going to go in here and look and see what's been scheduled to run by who and how and what, what's going on. So we've got a resource called System File Checker. It's, it's a command that allows us to go in and repair Win 10 and Win 11 systems. Um, if a file's corrupted, missing, or something along those lines, this can help us to go through and resolve that issue. It's not a always works kind of thing but it's something let me go scan to find out what's taking place and potentially fix it now you need to run it as administrator so when it comes up you can go look down in the search menu type in system file checker sfc right click on it run as administrator by running as administrator, you've got rights and permissions to actually do something with it. Whereas, if you don't, it's running and it's going to, wait a minute, unless you're an administrator, we're not going to let you do that. So, in a roundabout way, you're kind of wasting your time. I like to be able to do things 
when I need to rather than, oh, okay, let me exit and go run it as administrator and go right back to where I was so I can now actually do something. So we've got system configuration, which is MS config. Um, it allows us to go in and control how Windows starts and what's taking place. Um, I can go modify how the system starts up. So let's say that, like I said, our assumption at this point is it started up, but it ain't right. It's not acting right. Something may not have started up the way we want it to start up. So I can go into MS config and say, look, I want to go through and go through step by step. I might have some third party software that's tripping up the system as it's going through its startup. I can say, look, ignore all the third party stuff. Let's just focus on the Microsoft stuff and do a clean boot so that everything boots without interference. So we've got our system config to say different services, how it's booting. So it's a great resource to go through and say, all right, let me change a different setting about the boot sequence and how it's starting up. Forget about the third party stuff. I'll go ahead and shut it down and let it restart. And then see when it starts back up again, how we doing now? I could go into safe mode and safe mode is it gets rid of all that third party stuff and it also minimizes the resources we need to get this up and running. So it's like the bare minimum we need to get up and going. I don't want a bunch of add-ons going in it. Let's just keep it simple and see will this thing start without all the extras. It's kind of like starting your car without the radio and the AC and all and seeing how's it run if I don't have the AC and I don't have the radio and I don't have all this other stuff running. Will it just start up and run and run normal? That's the concept behind this. So we can go through and there's a variety of different tools we can use to go modify those settings. One of the things that we have the ability to do, and we'll talk about this over and over and over again, is we deal with system security, redundancy, making sure the system is able to recover when bad things happen. Could be, we've got a image of the hard drive, just in case. We could have backups we could have restore points, a variety of different things. If we've got, taken the time to go set up a restore point, well, this could help us get up and running, depending on how severe the damage is that we're trying to get around. Could have a virus, could have a worm, just don't know depending on where the problem is, the restore point, I, I, I look at it like a way back machine, time machine. Let's go back to the way things used to be a week ago. Now, if we go back in time, anything that's happened since that point in time no longer exists. It's like it never happened. We've got to have that understanding before we go back to a restore point. Now, restore points don't exist until you go in and configure them. And that's something we've, we've talked about. Um, and we talk about it over and over again, different ways to be able to recover. So we see the restore points. Don't go way, way, way back. 
go back a little bit at a time. Because once you've gone back, any restore points that you've saved after that no longer exist. You can't go back forward again once you've gone back. So here's the part that I'll say, this is really cool, it's got a lot of power, and leave it alone until you've got experience and understand all the ins and outs of it. So this is look but don't touch kind of thing. Now, the registry itself is set up like this. So if I can zoom it and you can see it a little better. So here's the registry, it's broken down into H key for the current user, H key for users, H key local machine, H key current configuration, H key classes root. So this, think of this like parent folders, if you will. So we've got the keys and then below it, we've got sub keys and values. Um, they call them hives within it. So we've got the register keys and hives. So here's H key local machine, SAM hive, security hive, system hive, software hive. And in there are varieties of different keys, little bits of information, things that are important. Now, before you edit the registry, Ask yourself, do I have to go mess with this and do I know what I'm doing? If either or both of those are, yes, I know what I'm doing and I have to do this, back it up first. That way, if you mess something up, you can go back and overwrite it and fix it. Repair the damage that you've done. Once you change it, it's gone. It's only thing you can do at that point is do a restore point. So make a copy, know what you're doing before you go in and play with it. I've been dealing with computers for 25, more than 25 years. I've been deep into computers and networking 25 years. Been programming for whew, over 40 years. So with that said, even after all that time, I don't mess with this. Not that I can't, I just choose not to. It's not something that's part of what I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. If your role puts you in a position where you've got to go in and manage your registry, great. Get familiar with it and know what you're doing. Right? Um, if your role does not require you to have to deal with it, don't mess with it. And it's as simple as that. And they keep reiterating. Things you do happen immediately and you have to take extra care when editing the registry. Just can't emphasize this enough. Okay. Now, if we're talking about Windows problems. Now there's the assumption that Windows has started, but it's not running the way we thought it was, or should. So with that said, they've got different problems here. Services aren't starting the way they should. Hmm. Restart it. Restart the whole system and see what happens. USB controller resource is giving you warnings. Uh, check different power settings and find out what's going on relative to the motherboard because this is something, it's a hardware issue and how the operating system is interacting with the hardware, but this is even deeper than the OS. This is hardware talking to each other, and this likely could be a driver issue on the board itself. Time drift, um, 
it could be that there's some third party software that's thrown something off. So we've got software that'll allow us to find out what's going on. Um, we get a low memory warning. Let's go into Task Manager and find out what's happening. Is there a memory leak? Is there software that's just beating it up? What's going on? Sluggish performance, same thing. System instability, go look at the Invent Viewer. So depending on what's happening, we've got tools to go in and see what's going on, measure the different resources, and see how bad is it and what's causing it. So any of the problems that we come across, we got to identify the problem, find out what are the alternatives that could be causing the problem, choose the most likely one first. Not the easiest one, the most likely one first. And then work our way through it. At all times, we reboot the system Maybe it didn't start up right. Look at the event viewer task manager resource monitor to find out what's happening within the system. Google it. Ask somebody else if they had the same kind of problem. And then from there, whatever ideas we come up with, hey, this is the most likely thing that's causing it. Well, let's go see, is that it? And if it is, let's fix it. Now, let's say I went through and I did that. I think this is the cause of it. It's this one application. I stop that application. And I tell myself, yep, that's it. I solved the problem. It's not that easy. I need to trust, but also verify. So I need to go make sure, did that actually work? And now what am I going to do to prevent it from happening again? And now I need to not just document what took place, but how to resolve it in the future. Should it happen again? Okay. So say services that are not starting up, I can manually go start them, go into task manager processes and Go in and click start and go into services console and do the same thing. Um, I can go restart the system and see maybe that'll fix it. An application may have changed the setting to start it up. It could be disabled for some reason. We don't know. We go dig in and find out what's going on. But one of the things we just talked about briefly was USB controller resources warnings. Now, this all too often could be something associated with a, a driver issue off the motherboard or in the motherboard. So I dig in to find out, go into device manager and see what's going on. I may be able to um, install the latest drivers I can possibly go change some power settings. Maybe that'll help. But it's one of those, come up with a strategy, how you're gonna go about resolving the issue and methodically, step-by-step, step, go through it. Um, time drift, I just mentioned that one a little while ago. And it's also called clock drift. And it happens when the system doesn't report accurate time to something that is very time sensitive. And we've got applications that can go through and find out what's going on. We've got the Windows time service and try to find out why is it not giving it the correct time. Okay. We've got some graphics here and we can go through and uh, look at the time properties. I can go set time, I can set um, time zone and all that. And then once we've done it, we assume everything's, it's automatic, it's got 
It's got everything taken care of. It's not always the case. Right. Low memory warning. I'm going to go into Task Manager first and foremost and find out what is using my RAM. And then all too often what will happen is you've got something, and I already said Chrome. Chrome's just beating your RAM up. Maybe it's not Chrome. Maybe it's something else. And you can't figure out what the name. I see the name of it. It's using all my memory, but I don't know what it is. Go online, look in the web, find out what is that? Why is it there? What, what's going on? Um, we've got something called page memory or virtual memory or page file system. And this could help you. Essentially, what it is, um, in my hard work course, I talk about the way the computer is laid out, and RAM is like that little inbox sitting on my desk, that short-term volatile memory. Long-term memory is what's in a file cabinet over in the corner, and that's the stuff I've got to get up and go walk through, walk across the room, and, and go search through the drawers and the files and file cabinets to find things. Now, if I don't have enough room in RAM, there's a special little place, which is our page file. And essentially what that is, is it's not RAM and it's not the traditional hard drive. It's like a folder in the very front of the top drawer. And we treat it a lot like we would treat RAM. And this is virtual memory. It's kind of like RAM, but not. And it allows us um, to do things without having to dig deep into memory so we can fetch data faster. Now, go check, see how much physical memory we have, how much are we using, look in system information. We go through update drivers. Um, sluggish performance, that's a matter of perception. But essentially, I'm going in the same step-by-step. Step. I'm going to look and see what's going on. I'll look at task manager, look at resource monitor, and find out what's using my system. If this thing's slowing down, why is it slowing down? Check and make sure that I don't have a virus. I've got updates and my system's secure. Most of the updates you deal with are security updates. If you're not up to date, it could be a security issue and there's something beating your system up from outside and that's what's slowing it down. You could have applications that you don't even use anymore that are actually using your memory. Um, look and make sure that you have enough RAM to run the OS. All too often, people look online and say, oh, well, I only need this much memory to run that operating system. And that's about all they have. And they install the OS. Well, you need three, four times that because that's just to run the operating system. How about the other applications and everything else you're going to do? You need more RAM than that. So... Check and see what the requirements are. Make sure you got enough to do what you're thinking you're going to be doing. Right. And look, see if there's something you need to get rid of that, you know, I'm not even using this anymore. Um, things that may have defaulted to start up every time you start the computer, I don't need them running unless I manually run them. But for whatever reason, when you installed it, it's set to start up every time you start the computer. I may use it once a month, but it starts up every time I start the computer so I can change that setting. Okay, Check for things that happen on a regular basis, but you don't need them to happen that often. Anything that's slowing the system down or using your resources. Now, our primary go-to task manager right up front. Um, look at Event Viewer. See what's taking place over time. 
make sure that all the updates are there. <coughs> Excuse me. That everything, check and see what's not running. Look to see, maybe I've got an issue with memory. Maybe I've got a bad hard drive. Maybe I've got system files across. There's so many different things. We've got step by step, go through everything, find out what's going on. All right, so once you've gone through those nine different steps, hopefully you've resolved whatever the issue may be, but have a strategy. And it's a great example, nine steps. Walk your way right on through it if the system's not stable. Now, sometimes applications like little kids fighting over the same resource. Sometimes applications start up and they're running and for whatever reason they're not finding what they're looking for and it's almost like they're just wandering around inside your CPU and they don't know where they're going they're just sitting there spinning and essentially at some point the system says yeah I'm done with this let's go ahead and stop this and the application crashes or it'll throw you an error. Okay. So we've got to go through and find out what's taking place. Go look at the logs and event viewers to find out what, what happened. I may need to, if some applications I can't repair, if I can repair it, try and repair it. If I can't, I'll try and update it. If I can't, uninstall it, reinstall it. Maybe that'll resolve it. But like I said, it could be a conflict with another app. Sometimes that's a thing. Right. Google it, find out what's going on. Maybe it's a common thing. Try and run it as administrator. Maybe it's a permissions issues that have taken place and something's changed. So there's a lot took place in here. There's a lot of stuff that we just got to be careful about what we do and when we do it. All right. If you got questions, reach out to me. Um, Messenger, your inbox over on the left side of Canvas. And I'll see you in the next module.